It all started with a welfare check. Grand Chute police officers were dispatched at 11.35 a.m. on Sunday, April 14, 2019 to 4300 West Edgewood Drive in the Wisconsin town after receiving a 911 call. Lieutenant Mike Rankis entered the home through the open garage door, which led downstairs. Inside the basement bedroom on the south side of the home lay a shotgun with a knife attached to its barrel, propped up against the wall. As the lieutenant moved through the living area and looked around the corner into the kitchen, he saw 73-year-old Letha Krause laying on top of 74-year-old Dennis Krause. Dennis had been shot first, once in the head with a 20-gauge shotgun slug. Letha was shot in the head twice and a third time in her right forearm with the same shells. Both were dead. Officers observed the dispensed shotgun shells and a knife on the floor, as well as an empty box of shotgun shells on top of the kitchen table. On the kitchen counter was a black leather jacket. Inside the pockets were more shotgun shells and a wallet. Back downstairs, officers observed on the bed a knife sheath, camouflage gloves, and a gray and blue Nike camouflage backpack. Inside the backpack was a red folder, which contained several pages of an elaborate plan that was months in the making, but that fell short of its grand ambitions for the most bizarre of reasons. A day earlier, the victim's grandson, Alexander Krause, had been lounging in the basement bedroom of the house that was now a crime scene. He had stayed the weekend to hang out at what he considered his happy place with the grandparents with which he held a close bond and was looking forward to spending that Sunday practice shooting with his granddad. That Sunday morning, Dennis, who was an avid hunter, took Alexander to the rifle range. Alexander really wanted to use his dad's most powerful weapon, a 12-gauge shotgun. His wish was granted. When they got back, Alexander went upstairs to his father's gun case to put the weapons back in the cabinet. Sometime later, the police would be at their doorstep. Dennis was born in July 1944 in Appleton, Wisconsin. He graduated from Menasha High School in 1962 and then joined the Air Force. Beside hunting, he had taken up a hobby in building projects in his workshop. It was while he was in the Air Force, stationed in Fort Riley, Kansas, that he met Letha, who was born in November 1945 in Abilene, Kansas. She graduated from Hope High School in 1963 and took up hobbies including gardening and quilting. The pair married on April 4, 1965, which meant that they were together for 54 years, doing all sorts of activities together, including traveling, camping, and spending time with her family. They had been enjoying their retirement years when they were killed. Dennis worked at welding and cutting company Miller Electric until his retirement in 2001, while Letha was a nurse up until she hung her scrubs in 2010. The pair had children, notably Charles and Shannon Krause, who themselves bore four children. Dennis and Letha loved spending time with their family, including having them over at their house. It was that hospitality, love, and bonding that brought Alexander over that weekend. Born March 18, 2002, 17-year-old Alexander was a junior at Nina High School and, at the time, lived with his parents Charles and Shannon at their home in Nina. He was an honor roll student in his first semester of the 2016-2017 school year, though he did suffer from some debilitating social issues. As a child, he was often the loner in the playground and at family functions. As cousins and other children ran around the yard, Alexander could often be seen hanging out alone, according to Charles Krause's cousin, Tammy. Alex was diagnosed with Asperger's Syndrome, a form of autism spectrum disorder that came with its list of obstacles. Struggles with changes in routine, adapting to different teachers, transitioning to multiple classrooms, and forming relationships with his peers and adults later in life, according to Tammy. As a special education teacher, Tammy said she understands when a child cannot find his place in a world that seems normal for everyone else. She wondered whether his depression was a byproduct of that experience. As Alex entered middle school, he struggled with the changes in schedules and navigating the crowded hallways, Tammy said. Alex often felt his classmates were laughing at him as he walked through the halls of his middle school. By his sophomore year at Nina High School, as he became more estranged from his peers, Tammy said he had contemplated suicide. 
The last time we were all together was the first Saturday evening in January of 2019, Tammy recalled. We often celebrated the Krauss Christmas this weekend. I hugged my aunt and uncle for the last time that night. The one thing I remember about that family Christmas party, though, was that Alex looked lost as he sat close to his father. I wondered what he was thinking that night as he quietly observed everyone and listened to the conversations that were taking place around him. It's December 22nd, 2021, and Alexander is sitting in his room of the Mendota Mental Health Institute in Madison, Wisconsin. The now 20-year-old had been admitted to the forensic program of the institute and had been rooming in the assessment and treatment unit. Doctors reported not seeing any unusual behavioral changes during his stay. He spoke in a coherent manner, participated in treatment groups involving therapeutic tasks, and engaged in normal activities outside those groups, including watching TV, playing sports, interacting with his peers, listening to music, and playing video games. Staff reported not seeing any symptoms of major mental illness, noting that he was linear, organized, and attentive. Since being admitted, he had a string of mental health evaluations, including one in which he gave bizarre answers to the questions from the psychologist which prompted the evaluator to note that his behavior was consistent with diagnoses of autism spectrum disorder and social anxiety disorder. He gave incorrect answers to questions he previously answered correctly, but the evaluator said this wasn't a result of someone suffering from a psychological break. His evaluator noted that he appeared volitionally produced with a deliberate inclination to provide seemingly bizarre responses not typically provided by genuinely psychotic individuals and considered the potential psychological process of denial related to the traumatic incident. That traumatic incident was the murder of his grandparents. He had since been through dozens of group therapy sessions to enhance his coping skills and reduce his anxiety. He was able to describe past events, including these traumatic ones, in great detail. On May 3rd, 2022, during one of his mental health evaluations and without prompting, he opened up about the morning of April 14, 2019 in great detail. Something evaluators noted was unusual for someone displaying a genuine case of a psychological break. How to give me 911. What is the address of your emergency? Um, I just killed my grandparents. I need the cops to come arrest me. Okay, what address, sir? Um, I'm not too sure of the address, but I'm on Winchester Road. Wait, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what road I'm on exactly. Okay. What city are you in? Appleton. What is your name? I'm Alex Strauss. Okay. Are you you're at the house where this happened? Yes, I'm still I'm still here. Okay, and you shot your grandparents? Yes, they're both dead, I think. I came here Saturday morning from my dad. My dad um, drove me here so I could sleep over here, and I had plans to them. And yeah, my my dad drove me here. On Saturday, he is John right now. Okay. He's at the house, but I think he's coming right now. Please do not call him. I want. To, I. I don't want to see him right now. Are you holding anything right now? My phone. Okay. But um. Are you holding also, any weapons? Um. It might appear that I, I'm holding a, a, holster for a hunting knife, but my hunting knife is inside. And I'm and I'm wearing a cartridge belt that has ammunition in it, but I don't have any guns on me right now. So you have ammunition. So you have ammunition, but not a gun. Yes. I put my gun my gun back inside. Okay. Yes. Um. I'm 17. Will I get executed? Sir, I I don't have the answer to that. I just want to make sure that they get to you at this time. I really don't Why have the answer. Sentence? Sir, I don't have an answer to that. I'm so sorry. Oh my god. A closer examination of the crime scene showed several items that would all come together to form a picture of what was really going on. To be clear, 
Inside the wallet found in the black leather jacket on the kitchen counter were Alexandra's driver's license and two student identification cards belonging to him. On the floor near the kitchen was a poster board with duct tape as well as a knife that was deliberately dropped before Alexander went outside to meet police. On the bed in the room where Alexander was staying were foam earplugs and a prescription bottle of antidepressant medication bupropion. Inside the front pocket of Alexander's grey and blue Nike camouflage pattern backpack found on the bed of the basement bedroom was a book about an executioner. In that red folder inside that same backpack, a plan months in the making was laid out. That plan was dated Friday, April 12, 2019, just two nights before the murders, and was also found in a Google Doc on his Chromebook and phone. The next day, Saturday, he asked that he be allowed to stay over, ostensibly to spend more time with his grandparents. In reality, he was preparing for something that would turn the Kraus family upside down. I'll only receive 15 years, Alexander told his doctors, citing what he said his attorney told him and based on a book he said he read. It was during one of his mental health evaluations in 2022 where Alexander, unknown to him at the time, was struggling to maintain his defense of mental instability. By this point, Alexander had already been convicted of the murder of his grandparents. The point of these evaluations was to determine whether he had the mental capacity to defend himself during the sentencing phase. The stakes were high for him. He either could get a shortened stay in prison with eligibility for an extended supervised release, or he could be locked up behind bars in prison for much longer. I'd like to serve it here, Alexander told an evaluator about his punishment. I hope to continue to be found incompetent. What he didn't understand at the time was that the evaluators weren't buying what they perceived as a deliberate attempt to mislead them. Given the nature of the evaluation, it is highly likely that he is intentionally attempting to portray himself as seriously mentally ill, delusional, cognitively impaired, and entirely incapable of participating in or understanding the proceedings to therefore be found incompetent and avoid sentencing, according to the report. For example, when asked what's worse, stealing gum or murder, he said stealing gum, which the report said was absurd for even patients suffering from a mental defect. The doctors also noted that he understood the legal process and punishments. This is further indicated based on a variety of factors including his history. It appears to be motivated by his intact knowledge and understanding about the proceedings and the potential outcomes. It also parallels the events surrounding the homicides in that Mr. Krauss was motivated to achieve a desired outcome, as perceived by him, and conducted himself accordingly toward achieving that outcome. Mr. Krauss explicitly stated this himself as well, and identified his desire to avoid the proceeding and sentencing as his intended legal strategy. His presentation and self-report garner support for the already compelling evidence that he is feigning psychiatric symptoms and impairment. Again, he consistently demonstrates an ability to conduct himself appropriately, cooperate, comply, advocate for himself, and effectively communicate when he perceives it, as self-serving and or when he is motivated to do so and believes it is to his benefit. I decided to write this on a Google Doc because my handwriting is pretty bad, Alexander wrote in an essay laying out his plan. Go to school at 7 a.m. with a gun concealed in the poster board. Hide in the bathroom until the middle of first period. Shoot the students in room 200 or 201 because those classrooms are large and have 15 or more students. I have been cornered and I'm going to kill a lot of people. Mankind is a cancer and I'm one of the doctors. A mass shooting like this gives me the godlike power to prevent future births. Part of Alexander's original plan was to start shooting at the school diversity fair, but ruled it out after realizing that there would be law enforcement and numerous escape routes available to students and staff. He said the idea of shooting up Nina High School, in which he was enrolled, was percolating in his mind since 2017, but the actual rough draft planning began in a Google Doc dated June 20, 2018. It would be the first of two school shooting plans, the other of course coming two days before he would kill his grandparents, and he had plans to make video or audio recordings of it all. He did extensive research, including into guns, how to dehumanize people, and other school shootings with a particular interest in the Columbine High School Massacre in Littleton, Colorado, 
The anniversary of which fell almost exactly 20 years to the day it occurred on April 20, 1999. He felt a particular affinity with Eric Harris, one of the two killers in the Columbine shooting, saying in his writing that he was cornered like he was. He wrote about his interest in dictators and Nazis. He started gathering supplies, including a gas mask from Amazon for which he said he would use to scare students at the school. He bought an ammunition belt and the black leather jacket, perhaps to mimic his favorite school shooters, who wore leather trench coats. He sought out whether he could get a bayonet for a shotgun and how to get poison, which suggests he may have thought about ending his own life after the act. These internet searches started in September 2018 and picked up in frequency in March and April 2019. By that point, and as referenced in his essay, his grades had started to plummet. And then the weekend finally arrived. He left his parents' place in Nina and went over to his grandparents' place that Saturday morning under the guise that he wanted to spend time with them. In reality, he was there to steal at least one of Dennis's guns to follow through on his plan. That Sunday morning, he told Dennis that he wanted to shoot guns, so his grandpa took him out to the shooting range. He got Dennis to allow him to practice with a 12-gauge shotgun, his grandfather's most powerful weapon. When they got back home, Alexander told Dennis he was going to put the guns away in his grandfather's wood gun cabinet in the upstairs bedroom. But that was just an excuse to prepare himself. Because at some point during Alexander's planning to shoot up his school, he realized that trying to sneak Dennis's guns out of the house was going to be much more difficult than he initially thought. So, in one of the multiple revisions to his plan, he included the killing of his grandparents so that the obstacle would disappear. Everything was planned, down to the timing of the operation. He knew that his father was going to pick him up at noon, so he needed to be out of the house and on his way to Nina High School before then, or else his dad would call the police on him for killing his grandparents. And so, as he stared at his grandfather's weapon case, he inserted his foam earplugs, loaded Dennis's 20 gauge shotgun, and put extra shotgun shells in his pocket, and went downstairs. He first shot Dennis in the back of the head before shooting Letha three times. He then pulled the prize 12 gauge out and duct taped a knife at the end of it to create a close quarters weapon known as a bayonet. He then grabbed the poster board and rolled it in preparation of hiding the shotgun to get it through the school doors. He then put on the ammunition belt. Because he still wasn't sure about his handling of the 12 gauge, he went outside to fire some rounds with it as practice. The plan was then to put a letter, wire cutters, and a gas mask in his backpack, roll up the 12 gauge shotgun in the poster board, check which car had more fuel, put his stuff in that car, and then drive to school and wait for Monday morning to arrive. But when he tried to get back inside the house, he realized he locked himself out. He used a spare key to get inside and went into the garage, where he realized that he couldn't find the keys to his grandparents' car, which he was supposed to use to drive to the school. The mini obstacles were apparently overbearing. At that point, he gave up. He left his cell phone on the hood, pulled up in the living room, turned on the TV, drank some soda, and called 911 on himself because he was scared about what his dad would do. But seeing relatively minor inconveniences were the only reasons he abandoned a grand plan many months in the making would be like pulling wool over the eyes in the face of clear evidence that school shooters sometimes just do it for the thrills. Well, I was going to, I had planned, you see, to shoot up my school, but it, and I was going to kill my grandparents, and then after that, drive to my school, and then shoot everyone there on Monday morning, but, but it's, but killing is really not what I thought it would be. I didn't get a rush from the killing, he later told his doctor, which likely curbed his enthusiasm to push through the little obstacles he ran into on his way to murder kids at his school because that was apparently the way he would achieve godlike control over his problems. In a twisted sense at the end of the day, the death of his grandparents might have saved children at the school. As expected, Alexander pleaded not guilty because of mental disease or defects for the first-degree murders. But while a jury acknowledged he suffered from a mental illness, it found that he did understand right from wrong, convicting him of the crime and sending him to prison. But for how long? The court ordered that Alexander be brought for a mental health evaluation as there was concern now that he wasn't competent to stand his sentencing hearing. 
hence why he was in the Mendota Mental Health Institute for competency restoration treatment. There initially was a strong push by his parents to find him not guilty because of his mental health problems. After his mental health evaluation found he was competent to go forward with sentencing, his parents, aunt, and lawyer hoped for a shorter 20-year sentence with mental health institutionalization afterward. In an affidavit, his father wrote that while they were aware that Alexander was previously diagnosed with having a cyst on his brain, they did not know this might have some kind of effect on his ability to function, that this may have some impact on his mental functioning. In a separate victim impact statement before his conviction in January 2020, Alexander's parents wrote, Alex is and has been struggling with his mental health. Since the tragedy, he has continued to decline from the lack of treatment and resources at the jail. His parents said they tried getting help for the boy they described as a shy loner. Alex is a caring and loving person who would never commit the heinous acts he is accused of but for his mental illnesses, the statement said. He needs proper psychological testing, long-term treatment, and trained support in an institutionalized setting. Alex won't get these things in prison. Alex belongs in a state institution that can provide him with what he needs. They added that Dennis and Letha would want the same for Alex. Charles' cousin Tammy wrote in her own statement, Alex's whole childhood has been plagued by social confusion and uncertainty. Alex created a horrific act of violence, and I don't think he or anyone else could argue otherwise. However, Alex's sense of reality at the time was skewed, and putting Alex in prison is not going to bring my aunt Letha and Uncle Dennis back, nor is it going to bring peace for Alex's family or any of us. Alex's family has suffered and they need to heal. The only way they can heal is to know Alex is getting the help and the intensive mental health treatment he needs. Please find it in your heart to have compassion and understanding for this family as they continue to navigate these muddy waters in their quest for hope, healing, and understanding. The pleas didn't work. While the judge acknowledged his mental health issues, he said he was bound by the law. He has significant rehabilitative needs, obviously. His foremost rehabilitative needs is treating his mental health. In the court's opinion, that has to be done in a confined setting. Hopefully, the Department of Corrections will have the ability to address that mental health need and treat him with therapy and with medications so he can get to the point where he said it's least dangerous as possible. He added that Alexander eliminated the two people that he felt safest with. That was his safe place. That was his happy place. And that is not lost on the court. That is a contributing factor with respect to the severity of this crime. In September 2022, the judge sentenced the then 20-year-old to two life terms, with parole eligibility after 20 years on each count. However, because the judge imposed the sentence to run consecutively, his opportunity for parole will only come after he serves 40 years, when he'll be 60 years old. A note on the manifesto. I tried my best to get it, but it wasn't in the court record. There was a motion filed by the defense to exclude certain pieces of evidence in front of the jury on the basis that they had no relevance to what became a trial about his mental functioning during the commission of the crime, and that there was concern that the evidence would prejudice the jury. I communicated with the police department, which deferred to the district attorney's office, which told me they cannot release it because there is an outstanding appeal in the case. Nevertheless, some of the details of the planning of the crime, perhaps ironically, came from the state's reply to the defense's motion to exclude said evidence. Furthermore, when the Nina Joint School District got word from police that it had apprehended a suspect who planned to shoot up the school, it released the following statement. Grand Chute Police informed the Nina Joint School District that the student arrested on two counts of first-degree intentional homicide on Sunday also had a plan to cause harm at Nina High School. Police have indicated that there is no danger to students and staff at the high school, and the school day on Monday will proceed as normal. Additional counselors are available to students, and there is an extra police presence as an additional precaution. We are appreciative of the efforts of our local law enforcement, and this is another reminder for all of us to remain vigilant in keeping each other safe. And finally, there were 24 school shootings in the United States in 2019, and 184 from 2018 to 2024, according to Education Week, which tracks these types of shootings every year. To think that a 25th was possibly prevented because the prospective shooter didn't get the thrill from the kill is terrifying to think about, to say the least.
Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to me narrate this story, which is based largely on the primary sources. Special thanks must go to the local reporters bringing these cases to our attention and to you guys for engaging in the subject matter. Be well, engage in acts of charity, and I'll see you next time.